Hello, everyone. My name is Rahul, and uh, I'm with Loft Labs. Uh, I head growth marketing here at Loft. And today uh, we have with us Costas, who is going to give us an amazing presentation on uh, virtual clusters for development and CI CD workflows. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. You will see it on the uh, on the right of yourself on, on your screen. Uh, and then mostly we will get to your questions at the end because Costas has a packed agenda. So with that, Costas, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, today I'll be your host. My name is Costis. That's the correct pronunciation. I'm a developer advocate at CodeFresh. Uh, CodeFresh is an enterprise solution for Kubernetes deployments, and we will see some of its features along with Loft. I'm also working a lot in the open source uh, area. I'm a maintainer in Argo Louch, but we're not going to talk about Argo Louch today, unfortunately. I love virtual clusters. I think it's one of the most uh, interesting projects right now. And it's something that uh, we change a lot, you know, your workflows or your processes if you adopt it correctly. And today we're mostly going to focus on, uh, you know, Kubernetes and virtual clusters and uh, containers. So we have a packed agenda because essentially we don't have just one demo. We have four demos with some theory um, in between. And the demos are structured in a way where each demo builds on top of the previous one. So the first demos might look a bit, uh, let's say, simplistic, but the last one is close to a, a real world scenario. So uh, I didn't you know, want to just put everything in a single demo. I want to show how, how I'm building things from start uh, to finish. And there is some theory um, in between. Uh, as Rakul said also, feel free to ask questions. I'm one of the people that believe that there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So even if you think that asking the question will make you, I don't know, look uh, not knowledgeable in this area, just ask it. And uh, at the end, we will um, we'll try to answer them all if we have enough time. But please, you know, ask. And if, if, if I say something that I take for granted and you don't understand what I'm saying, just uh, ask. It's much easier than not that than not saying anything. So I know that several presentations uh, start and they go right into tools and solutions and uh, how you can solve uh, problems. Uh, and it's fine, you know, tools are important, but tools only give us value if we help people, because this is why you're here, to help people. So I'm going to start the presentation from a different perspective and talk about the people first, then their problems, and then their tools, which I think is a much, much more um, natural way of doing presentations. So these are the types of people that we are going to talk uh, today. They are three different personas, and maybe you are already familiar with them, or you are even part of one of them. Uh, we have developers for building code, uh, operators for running systems and keeping systems healthy, and then we have everybody else. Maybe it's uh, team leads, uh, department leads, uh, CTOs, DevX people. Everybody else is involved in um, the software delivery process within um, a company. And as you can imagine, these people have different needs, different ideas, and different uh, priorities. So if we focus on developers first, what the developers want, they want to write code. That's the only thing they want, write code and um, send features to production. So essentially, they like to move fast. They like to, let's say, break things. Uh, and they don't really care about Kubernetes. That's not, let's say, they're, they're it's not important for them. They care about writing code and sending it to production. And if it's a VM or Kubernetes or Docker Compose or whatever, that's not really important for them. They want to focus on writing code. And not writing code is something that they don't really like. So they want an easy way to create infrastructure for their own needs. So ideally, what they would like is to see a button that says, uh, create a new environment for me or a new database. They click the button, they get their database or their cluster, and they don't know what happens behind the scenes, and they don't care about what happens uh, behind the scenes. So this is, these are the needs of developers. <clears throat> then at the, other, at the other end of the spectrum, we have operators, and these people have different names. Uh, some of them call them operators, uh, SREs, system administrators, uh, DevOps people, Infra people, uh, there isn't like a um, common agreement here. Name them as you want. Essentially, I describe the, the people that keep systems running. So for them, the biggest priority is to have uh, systems ready and sending traffic all the time. Uptime is super important for them. Essentially, they are 
let's say, in contrast with developers, they want to move slowly. For them, deploying fast, deploying too fast in production is not something they really uh, enjoy. They hate, um, uh, you know, tickets and opening tickets and closing tickets and working with tickets. And most important of all, usually they don't like uh, buttons and UIs and let's say friendly uh, dashboards. They prefer automation. They want to automate everything. That's their main goal to automate all their daily processes. So they are the people that like um, CLIs, uh, scripts, uh, automated uh, processes, uh, pipelines, and everything that has nothing to do with the UI. And last, we have the, um, the other people in the company that are dealing with uh, the software delivery process. Here is an example I've chosen uh, DevEx, if you have this kind of profile in your company, but maybe it's your team lead or your CTO. And essentially, they care about velocity, not only velocity of you know, sending features to production, but also uh, how many failures you have in production, how much time it takes to onboard a new developer, how much time it takes to form a new team, how much time it takes to form a new service. So they are not, let's say, involved with writing code or deploying uh, software, but they are interested in the overall processes. So these are the personas that I'm going to talk about. And essentially, the main theme from this presentation is that the clusters offer something for everybody. So even though in theory, these three personas are completely different, uh, big clusters can help all three personas. So what are big clusters? Uh, I would assume that if you are here, maybe you already know what is a virtual cluster, but just to, to be certain that everybody's on the same page, I'm going to talk a bit about big clusters. And this is the official diagram that Loft has in their documentation about big cluster, which is great uh, if, let's say, you are a um, developer or you want to extend big cluster. But personally, I don't really like this diagram. So I'm going to show you my own diagram, which I think makes uh, things a bit more simpler to try to understand what is a virtual cluster. So here I have two clusters. And on the left, it's the standard uh, Kubernetes deployment. You have a single real cluster. It's a single cluster. And it has um, different namespaces where people, um, let's say, deploy their applications. There is a Kube API uh, for uh, communicating with the cluster. And everybody's working with same spaces. And this is, let's say, the most common way of working with a cluster, even when you have multiple users. And on the right, I'm introducing virtual clusters. And you can see that right now, in its namespace of the parent cluster, there is a virtual cluster. And even though this virtual cluster is, let's say, constrained in the namespace, it has its own Kube API. And it answers to all the API requests of any tool that is compatible with that API. So customers can still work with these virtual clusters, and they don't understand that the class that they are talking to is not a real one. I mean, it's not a secret. Maybe you can do some things to discover it, but all tools should be compatible. It's a real Kubernetes cluster. And the first advantage that you can see right away, if you have ever worked with um, custom resources, when you're working with a single cluster, uh, the custom resources are global. They are shared between everybody, you install them once. And usually, you have problems with the conflicts if somebody wants to use a newer version of our CRD or an older version. With virtual clusters, because the CRDs are now installed per cluster, you have, um, let's say, greater capabilities of what kind of software you want to run. And actually, virtual clusters allow you to run a different Kubernetes version. So maybe it's different than the parent one, or even, um, let's say, a different uh, distribution. So it, it doesn't have to be the same distribution of Kubernetes uh, as you're using. So I think this is a better explanation on what are virtual clusters. And usually, the first question that you ask um, when you see virtual clusters is, is it slower than using a real cluster? And I, I understand this question because you know this is how we think, especially when you're coming from um, virtual machines where there is some overhead or if you're using containers. And again, there is a minor overhead. So in this case, I'm going to say that all the workloads of the virtual clusters are actually running in the namespace of the parent cluster. There is no indirection there. So the Kube API that you're talking to is, let's say, your own, but the workloads get scheduled in the parent cluster. So there shouldn't be any performance if there. And actually, if you look at the diagram on the left, maybe if you have a super popular cluster and you have too many users, communicating with the uh, Kube API, you might have a bottleneck there. Uh, but if you're using virtual clusters, because each user is using their own Kube API, maybe it's even faster 
to use virtual clusters in your company, especially in uh, multi-tenancy scenarios. So not only virtual clusters are not slower, but depending on your use case, they might be uh, even faster. So I think this is a really interesting feature and one of the, one of the reasons I love uh, virtual clusters. Okay, so we, we know we have a virtual clusters. What do we use them for? Um, for me, this picture shows it all, like it's a Swiss army knife. You can use it for, for everything, for many scenarios. It's one of the most, let's say, powerful tools ever. Here I have some of the most popular um, use cases. So the most classic one, and we are going to talk a bit about this today, is to create environments for developers. And developers will be you know, super happy if they have a cluster that they can do whatever they want. And they think they have access to all the namespaces, but they do not. And they can install their own CRVs, their own applications, or whatever else they need. Uh, then you have multi-tenancy scenarios where it's not you know, temporary environments, but it's permanent environments. You have, let's say, a company with many customers, and you want uh, to give a service to, to each uh, customer. And instead of using isolated clusters, you put them all in a single cluster. This is actually one of the use cases that we have at CodeFresh. So at CodeFresh, we are using V clusters for our own product. Uh, then you can have uh, things like testing different uh, cluster versions, because remember, I said one of the advantages is that you don't have to constrain yourself to the same version as the parent cluster. So maybe your parent cluster is Kubernetes 1.23, and you're uh, launching a virtual cluster that is also 1.23, or a virtual cluster that is 122 or 24, you can go some versions um, up and down. So you don't need to, to launch a real cluster in order to, to uh, launch different versions. And the last one, which is also popular because of the economy right now, is for uh, cost uh, reasons. Uh, virtual clusters are part of a main cluster. So if you launch 20 clusters, let's say 20 virtual clusters, you still pay the control plane for only one cluster, the parent one. So it's very easy for you to have a large number of clusters, and especially for scenarios um, where, let's say, you have, want to have many clusters running all the time, and you cannot do it, and you don't care about the control plane costs uh, anymore. So these are some of the scenarios that we have seen uh, so far. And I'm not going to talk about all these scenarios. Uh, I'm really lucky. Right now, a lot of people have talked about these scenarios. If you go to the CNCF um, YouTube channel that is on the link there, and you simply search for uh, for big cluster, uh, you will find se already several presentations uh, that talk about some of these cases. The first one is the one I talked about. It's the one that we use internally. Uh, this was a cubicle presentation. It talks about multi-tenancy, but you can see also some other videos uh, that talk about review environments or stuff like that. So uh, if you were interested in about a different use case than the one I'm going to show today in the presentation, fear not, there are several videos out there that explain them. And I think it's also, a testament to the capability of virtual clusters, like how many companies are using virtual clusters uh, for different uh, scenarios. I think that the two middle ones are from uh, Adobe, like Adobe really likes uh, virtual clusters. OK, so we said um, we're going to talk about the people. We have talked about the people. And then we talked about uh, the tool. And now let's connect them together and see how the tool can help uh, the people. So Loft. Uh, apart from virtual cluster, you know, the infrastructure also has a commercial product that is what developers would like, like a very friendly uh, dashboard for managing um, virtual clusters. Um, now, I know what you will ask here. You will say, hey, you just told us that um, developers don't really care about Kubernetes. So why should we provide them a dashboard for creating Kubernetes clusters? And yes, you are correct. And uh, this is what you should do. Unfortunately, there are some scenarios where developers still need to be exposed to Kubernetes. Uh, the most common example is you have a complex application which maybe needs to be deployed to multiple namespaces. So at the very least, they should know about namespaces. Uh, then maybe the application itself needs to be tested on different Kubernetes version, or the application itself is a Kubernetes operator. So it has to work with Kubernetes. Um, and this is, again, something that developers must know. But I think the most common scenario is speed. Like if you if you are familiar with how cloud providers work, usually when you create a real cluster, maybe it takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes, which is too slow. Nobody likes to wait. And I think developers really like it when um, you know they get a cluster in half a minute or one minute. So it, it, it's OK, I think, in some cases to give them this um, abstraction and have them learn at least some basic Kubernetes concepts in order to make their life uh, easy. 
Okay, so time for the first uh, demo. And I'm going to show this um, uh, dashboard that I'm talking about. So now we are focusing on developers. And remember, I said developers uh, don't like uh, anything else apart from code. If they need something else, they would like to have a button. So this is the Loft uh, dashboard. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because um, it has great features that are already documented in the YouTube channel from Loft. Uh, but one of the central things that you can do here is, of course, you can create spaces, which is the same thing as namespaces. That's fine. But the magic thing is this button, create virtual cluster. So as a developer, I log into, into this UI. And without uh, caring about uh, kubectl configs, authentication, uh, service accounts, or whatever, I have a nice button that I click. I can optionally pick a template on uh, the cluster. And if you're an administrator, you can put uh, different templates. And let's say here I put my name of the cluster, so webinar demo. And then I click a button, and boom, that's it. There is a new cluster created just for me that I can uh, create. Now, of course, this is the basic use case. You can add here um, security. You can define exactly what goes into the cluster. You can create uh, teams. Uh, you can create projects and uh, set the security and make developers see only the projects that they, they want. Uh, Loft also has a very nice uh, CLI. Uh, so if you don't like uh, the UI, even if you are a developer, you can also use the, the CLI and connect to the clusters and do whatever you want to, to do. So there, the cluster is ready. I got a cluster just for me in maybe 30 seconds. So developers are super happy about this. And I can equally uh, delete the cluster when I don't um, need it anymore. So. Developers should be happy with this because they can get, you know, a cluster quickly. But this is only half of the story. Like, OK, I got a cluster. What do I do next? The next obvious thing is I want to deploy there. And usually developers have, let's say, two needs. Either you want to deploy while you're developing a feature, so doing local development, or you want to deploy as part of a CI CD pipeline. Now, we don't have time to show both scenarios. So today, I'm going to show the second one, and this is the the title of the uh, webinar using CI CD pipelines. But if you want to know about uh, local development, uh, the next obvious thing would be to look at the other products from Loft. There is a dev space and dev pod, but they do exactly that. And I'm super happy that I saw last week there is a, a YouTube video in the Loft uh, YouTube channel that explains exactly the scenario, how you create a cluster with Loft, and then how you use it in order to start uh, development using your, your ID. So, as far as I'm concerned, okay, developers should be happy right now for um, for local development. They get what they want at least until the feature is ready and needs to be pushed. Okay, so let's go back to the, the slides. Uh, so this is Loft. You should check it out, especially if you are um, a developer. These are also the links to the other two products: DevSpace.sh and uh, DevPod. As I said, there is no time you know, to show all the features. There is also another interesting integration with Argo CD. And remember, I work um, as an open source uh, contributor for Argo CD and Argo Rollout. So that's also a super exciting feature. Uh, but let's say that we have covered developers. Uh, like developers who want to focus on code, they want to click a button and get what they want. We need to also see how virtual clusters are relevant to the other uh, two personas. So rem remember I said that. Um, Operators or SREs, they are the exact opposite. They don't like uh, UIs. They don't like um, uh, buttons. And they prefer to automate stuff and to do things automatically with uh, scripts. So Loft, again, is here is one step uh, ahead. So apart from the UI that we just saw, there is also a very friendly uh, CLI that you can use uh, to create clusters. Uh, there is also um, a Helm installation. And actually, the one thing I did mention is that Loft itself is installed with Helm, so it's super easy to, to install it. But the most interesting scenario for me is to use Terraform. And I'm, let's say, pretty amazed that I've searched about how to use Terraform with uh, uh, V clusters. And right now, in the YouTube channel of Loft, there are exactly zero videos on how to do it. So hopefully, this webinar will go into this channel and you will know uh, how to use it with Terraform. And why I'm talking about Terraform? Because it's one of the most favorite tools of um, infra people, of SREs. People uh, have invested a lot in Terraform, especially when it comes to infrastructure as code. So usually when they want to integrate a brand new tool 
to their own environment, the first question they ask is, how can I do it with uh, Terraform? And in theory, you know, you could just say, no, you create your own provider. No, we don't need to do that. Loft has already created a provider for Terraform for virtual clusters, and you can see the link there. And this allows you to use your existing Terraform infrastructure, which you should already have, and manage your Loft instance. And I'm going to talk about virtual clusters today, but every other, let's say, Loft uh, construct, such as the projects for the spaces, can be can, spaces can be also managed with Terraform. Uh, one word of warning: Loft uh, has just released um, version 3.x. And the Terraform provider right now contains support for both this version and the previous version. So make sure to match your Loft version with the uh, Terraform version that uh, we are using. As you can imagine, I'm saying this because I had uh, an issue where I'm using uh, constructs for Loft v2 while I had the latest version. So a virtual cluster instance is Loft v3, and this is what we're going to see uh, today. So how it works, uh, if you have never seen Terraform before, it's essentially um, configuration language, uh, DSL, where it describes things uh, declaratively. It looks like JSON. It's not exactly a JSON. It's a HCL, which is a special language to HashiCorp. And essentially, you describe what things need to happen, and then Terraform takes care of all the details. So in our example, there is a provider for Loft that you see there. And then you say, uh, I want a cluster, and you describe its name, its name spaces, maybe where the project goes and um, stuff like this, and then you apply it with, um, with Terraform. So let's go to the second demo. Uh, so here, um, I have already a repository. This is uh, public in GitHub. Uh, I think I have the link um, later, but you can uh, see it. it's not something uh, private. And it has the code from all examples. The example that we are going to talk about today, uh, right now, is uh, super simple. There is only one Terraform file that you can see here. And essentially, I'm saying, hey, I'm going to use uh, the Terraform provider for Loft. And I define my clusters. And you can see this count here. And you can understand why this is important for operators. Because let's say I want to create 20 virtual clusters. I'm not going to go to the UI and click a button 20 times. I want an automated way. So this is a standard capability of Terraform. Here, I have an example uh, three because I'm in a very small uh, cluster. But in theory, I could, have, um, I could have 20 or 25 or 1,000 or whatever. So now, not with a single click of a button, but with a single uh, Terraform command, I can create um, three clusters in my Loft instance, three is the example I'm going to use, but it could be 20. And you can see here, Terraform says, hey, I'm going to add three things One you enter, once you enter yes. So I enter yes, and now Terraform is creating the cluster. So I can go back to my uh, UI, and you can see the clusters here uh, getting created. So if I'm an operator, and let's say a developer comes to me and says, hey, I need 20 clusters, and I'm not going to click the create button 20 clusters, you say, that's not a problem. Let's use Terraform and let's um, uh, create the, the clusters right now. And if you're familiar with Terraform, you know that uh, creating something is super easy and also destroying something is super easy. So I can also run the destroy command and just as easily as I created the clusters, uh, I can also delete the clusters uh, right away. So it's super easy to, to create and delete clusters on the spot, which is exactly what operators need. They want to create stuff uh, quickly, tear it down quickly, and maybe if you want to do a quick test, um, you can run it right away. So this is how Terraform works with um, virtual clusters. So let's go back to the presentation. Ah, this is the link of the, um, the GitHub repo that has all the examples. So if you want to see how this code works, uh, you can go there. OK, so moving on. Uh, that's fine. I mean, we have automation. But in the real world, it's not a good practice to run Terraform from your workstation. Like, you don't need to have Terraform on your workstation. And also, if you're familiar with Terraform, there is a big question what you do with the Terraform state, which is what Terraform is using to store uh, the existing state of your infrastructure. And usually, what you want is to have Terraform uh, running centrally somewhere and also the state running centrally somewhere. So. That example is great, the previous one, for understanding 
uh, how Terraform works with virtual clusters, but it's not what you would do in a real company. So what should you do in a real company? So this is where uh, Codefresh comes in. Uh, now Codefresh, like Loft, is a huge project with many capabilities. It has three modules, um, the CI module, the CD module, and the GitOps module. I'm not going to talk about all the modules. Essentially, today we're just going to talk about uh, pipelines. And Codefresh pipelines um, are Docker-based. So there is a, here is a pipeline example, and it's a box that you see is essentially a Docker container that you run uh, stuff. And one thing that is different for Codepress is that it's integrated with uh, Docker Redis and Kubernetes clusters. And I will explain why this is uh, important. Now, again, I know what you will ask. You will say, hey, I know that you're working for Codepress, but why are we looking at Codepress and we're not using um, GitHub Actions or Jenkins or TeamCity or Circle CI or something else? These are all great products, uh, but they are, let's say, generic VM products that um, were created mainly for virtual machines, and then they try to adapt, adopt to Kubernetes and uh, um, containers. While Codefresh was created for containers and Kubernetes from scratch. So here I have a very simple example of the exact same pipeline uh, that builds a Docker image. And you can see on the left, uh, in GitHub Actions, you need to deal with uh, Docker authentication, see how you can access the registry, and then push the container, while the Codefresh pipeline is one third of the size. And it just says, hey, build the Docker image and push it. And you can see there are no credentials, no the passwords, no nothing. I'm just mentioning a Docker registry uh, by name. And the same thing can happen also for Kubernetes. So again, I have on the left a pipeline for uh, GitHub Actions that deploys to a Kubernetes cluster. And you can see a big part of the pipeline is authentication, like how you get access to the cluster, how you get a kube config, and then how you uh, deploy. And again, the Codefresh pipeline is super simple. It just says, I'm going to uh, deploy to Kubernetes cluster by name. So these advantages will come you know, evident in how we are going to use Codefresh and virtual clusters together in order to give something to, to everybody, both developers and operators. So what's the magic sauce? The magic sauce is that uh, Codefresh has a special setting screen where usually the operator goes and installs once a piece of infrastructure, so your Docker registries or your, um, let's say, Kubernetes clusters, and then everything is referenceable by, by name. So no credentials are in the pipelines. So let's go back to the, um, the demo. So here, I'm again an operator. Uh, and using you know, Terraform on its own is fine. But now I want to automate Terraform itself. So I'm not going to run Terraform from my CLI. I'm going to run it from, uh, from Codefresh. So here, I have a Codefresh uh, pipeline which essentially says, hey, clone the source code, uh, get access to the cluster. And you can see there are no credentials here. I'm just saying I'm going to use my real cluster. And then it runs uh, Terraform. And this runs the same example as before. It creates um, several uh, virtual clusters that you will see in Loft. So this pipeline is uh, centrally in Codefresh. I don't need to have Terraform on my laptop. I don't need to know the credentials to the cluster. Everything is here. Um, I run it, and essentially, behind the scenes, it will do the same thing. It will uh, go and create the clusters. And again, if you're familiar with Terraform, one question is uh, how you use or how you set up the, the Terraform state. And the magic thing here is that I have already gone and connected, like I did this before the webinar, the real cluster, my parent cluster. I connected it uh, to Codefresh so that Codefresh uh, knows about it. So if I go into this screen, Right now, Codefresh knows about the parent cluster. I've named the real cluster so that it's clear which clusters are real and which are not real. You can imagine next we will add um, virtual clusters. So this cluster is here once with the authentication. And then this makes my pipeline super easy because I can just say, uh, go to this cluster and deploy something or use it as a Terraform state um, just, just by name. So this is what happens uh, in this step. Here, if you see the YAML from this step, it just says uh, use the real cluster uh, and then uh, do whatever you want. So this has created the clusters. I have created four clusters in 15 seconds, okay, which is super fast. And then just for fun, I'm also using the CLI uh, to use to, to verify the clusters. So now I have four clusters uh, here. And again, you know, you can imagine I had 20 clusters or 25 clusters. 
So what have I gained now? Now I have gained the capability to also work in a GitHub style because I'm not using my local workstation. Uh, I have actually this example in this GitHub repo that I mentioned uh, before. So this example is in Matic Elastic Remote. And here I can start a, a Git um, workflow. So let's say I created these four clusters for my developers. And then one of the developers says, hey, we need two more clusters. OK, what do I do? I do what every, let's say, developer would do. I can come here into this file that defines the number of clusters, remember the count. And I say, OK, this team needs now six clusters. OK, so I change for six. And I can commit the change. I'm not going to commit them here. Maybe I will create a new branch. And I will name it uh, two more clusters. Two more clusters, proposed chains. So I have now created um, a pull request. And then you can follow the workflow that you have in your company for your pull request. So maybe you know in your team, somebody needs to approve the changes in infrastructure. Uh, so you can assign this to your um, uh, team lead or the other team and say, hey, I'm going to do this. Do you agree? And the magic thing here is I have created a second pipeline because unlike some products that I'm not going to name, Godfrey has the capability to have multiple uh, pipelines for the same repo. And this is a separate pipeline that says preview. And essentially, it's similar like this. But if you are familiar with Terraform, instead of running uh, Terraform apply, it runs uh, Terraform plan. So this will run, and it will not actually do uh, anything at all. It will just say what will happen if I will merge this pull request. So this is the one that is running uh, right now, but we can go to one of the previous ones. And if we look at the, the log, uh, there it said, I think this, this was the same example. Hey, I'm going to add uh, two more clusters and uh, change your clusters. So not only I have a pull request here, but I actually get some indication of what will happen um, if I merge that pull request. So from this point on, onwards, uh, even operators, you know, are happy because they don't have, let's say, to uh, communicate and say, hey, I'm going to do this. Do you agree or not? You can work with Git uh, and Terraform exactly the same way uh, as you want. And just to close this example, we can do the same thing uh, as before. There is a pipeline that does Terraform destroy. So after I'm finished, let's say my developer says, uh, I don't need these clusters anymore. I can run the, um, the pipeline. And then it will use the same Terraform state using the parent cluster. And then um, it will destroy the clusters uh, after it's finished. Um, OK, so we don't need to wait for this. Let's go back to the slides. OK, so we have seen how you use uh, Terraform in the pipelines uh, in CI. So we have talked about. Uh, the basics, the building blocks. Let's finally see a real world example. Okay, enough with the uh, demos that show one small thing and one uh, small thing there. Let's see a real example. And the example I've chosen today is um, developer onboarding or creating a new service. This is the scenario where a developer says, okay, we have a need for creating a brand new application. Maybe it's a new uh, microservice or maybe it's a brand new application and they need all the stuff that they can work. And remember, this scenario is interesting both for developers because it affects their um, daily job. But also, uh, it's interesting for DevX people because they want you know, to see developers move uh, fast and understand how fast the team is deploying and how fast the team can create a brand new service. So usually what happens in big companies especially is that the developer says, I want to create a brand new application. And then they need to create an inventory of stuff and say, OK, what do I need? I need a Git repository for my source code. Uh, I need a cluster to deploy my application. Maybe I need a second cluster for a unit test, integration test. Uh, I also need a pipeline. I need a Docker registry. Uh, I need a way to access the Docker registry. And then they start collecting these things. And maybe big companies, it's a different team. So first, they go to the GitHub team, and they say, give me a repository. Then they go to the uh, Kubernetes team, and they say, give me a cluster. Then they go to the uh, let's say docker registry team and they say i need access to the docker registry and this can be let's say a super lengthy process maybe you need to, to open some tickets to people and say i need a cluster and then wait for somebody to look at the ticket and then finally you get the cluster and you get the cluster but you don't have your pipeline and you are blocked so this is a very common scenario that you see in a lot of uh, companies where you know 
working in an existing project is super fast, but trying to create a new microservice is super slow or a new project. So we don't want to do this. What do we want to do uh, instead? We're going to create everything in a single step. So ideally, you should go to one person, say, hey, I'm starting a brand new project, and they will run something, a single button, a single script, a single Terraform file, it doesn't matter. And then it will create everything that you need and get back to you after five minutes. Yes, this is possible. And this is actually what we're going to see in the demo. And remember, I said before that, uh, you know, Loft, like the dashboard covers um, effectively the, the local development, like I'm a developer and, you know, I'm working. Uh, but just getting access to a Kubernetes cluster is not enough for an application. You also need uh, deployment pipelines and GitHub uh, repositories. So in all the previous demos, we have seen some of the building blocks. So what do we need? We need a, a GitHub repo for the source code. Uh, we need some clusters, and we have already seen how we can create virtual clusters automatically and very fast. Uh, we also need a deployment pipeline, and we have seen Codefresh pipeline, but you know, not you know pipelines that uh, deploy code and compile code. And then we also need a bootstrap process for everything. And as you can imagine, we are going to use Terraform because Terraform is great for this uh, process. So we have seen that Terraform pro uh, has a provider for Loft. Terraform also has a provider for GitHub. And essentially, it allows you to create a, a new GitHub repository. And the simplest thing you can do is you get a, a template repository. This is a built-in feature of GitHub where you have, let's say, a starter application or a skeleton of application. And usually, maybe um, you know it's approved by your architects or by your team. And they say, this is how a new microservice should be uh, written. That's the, the starting project. So you can use that uh, repository. So you know, don't imagine that we are going to create a repository from scratch, adding fi files manually. This would be uh, too lengthy. We're going to take um, a template repository and copy it. So this part is covered by Terraform. Uh, then there is also a Terraform provider for Codefresh, naturally, because we also love Terraform. So the pipeline that you have seen before, I created manually, but Codefresh has a way of creating automatically pipelines, like programmatically, without me actually going into Codefresh and say, hey, I want a new pipeline. So as you can imagine, we're going to create a pipeline for developers for compiling their code and deploying the clusters. And this is what we are going to do. We are going to create a master pipeline in Codefresh that itself is creating everything that the developer needs. So it will create a GitHub repo for source code. It will create virtual clusters, as we have seen. It will create pipelines in Codefresh. So this is a pipeline that creates pipelines. Okay. It will connect the clusters to Codefresh. And then after we finish, we will say to the developer, OK, everything is. Um, is ready. So this is the magic button that we are going to push. Uh, this is how it looks and uh, the pipeline. And let's see the final demo, the most complex one. Hopefully, uh, it will work. So just before I start, uh, I want to show you some uh, important things. Uh, first of all, uh, I showed you the um, uh, cluster integration screen where you say to uh, to Codefresh which cluster you have. And right now, uh, I'm going to show you uh, that there is only one cluster, it's the, the real cluster. Okay, that's the only thing that Codefresh knows right now. I'm also going to show you uh, my connection to Docker Hub. So I've already created Docker Hub connection here. So the pipeline I'm going to create will say, let's compile the code and push it to Docker Hub. And developers don't need to know anything about how it works and how it's authenticated. And the last thing I'm going to show you is um, uh, Codefresh also ha has a dashboard for environments. Uh, which right now is completely empty. It doesn't have um, anything at all. So the thing I have done uh, here, ah, by the way, the other demo has finished and the clusters are destroyed. So here I have already uh, gone ahead and created, let's say, a repository, which is my, uh, let's say, template, the starter project. This is a, a Go code. And let's assume that in my team I have agreed and say, Every microservice should be written with these files uh, and these things and these pipelines. So this is my uh, starting point. And then I'm going to go to my uh, Love Demo project here in Codefresh. And I will click 
the most complex pipeline ever, create everything. Yes, this is why I call it like uh, this, create everything. So let's uh, run it. So essentially, this is the scenario where you know I'm an operator and the developer comes to me and says, hey, I'm creating a brand new application. Give me everything I need. And the only thing I do is press this button, nothing else. Uh, now, while it's running, I'm going to show you a bit uh, the code. I'm not going to go into too many you know, Terraform uh, details because this webinar is not about uh, Terraform. But essentially, uh, it has um, three clusters. Let's assume the developer will uh, use uh, QA, staging, and prod. And this is how we define them in Terraform. And actually, here, I'm taking advantage of the feature I mentioned before. So just for fun, you can see this cluster is K3S while this cluster is K0S, and this cluster is standard uh, Kubernetes. So if you know a developer says, I want to test different Kubernetes versions, they can do it um, just fine. And then I have some manifest which uh, have standard things like ingressing, ingresses for exposing the clusters, which uh, I don't think it's important right now. And then these are the, the pipelines. So, even though I clicked a button, behind the scenes, everything is stored in Git, and I can follow the exact same uh, procedure later if I want to change something. So if I want another cluster, I can go and create um, a pull request. So like before, we start and we say we're choosing the real cluster. This is I have named like here. So this is the real cluster. And then I'm creating um, the virtual clusters. And in this case, they will take some more time because I'm also uh, creating uh, ingresses for them. So they are going to be externally accessible if uh, you know a developer wants to, to work there and connect their application. Then just for fun, I'm also going to uh, create a virtual clusters. And then the rest of the steps uh, are conference specific, which for this webinar are not really that um, important. It's this. This is not, let's say, a good thing to do in production. It's essentially the privileges and the ARBA controls that you get to Codefresh, uh, what to do in the clusters. Because these are virtual clusters, remember these are virtual clusters that I'm creating, essentially I'm saying uh, be an admin and do whatever you want because I don't really care. Uh, they are virtual. And then the final thing is uh, making Codefresh aware of those clusters. And then, as I said, create the pipelines that developers themselves will use. So remember, this is the pipeline I use uh, as an SRE. But I want also to give access to, to a developer for actually building uh, the application. So this has uh, finished. So you can see I created the three external like, accessible clusters with ingresses in one minute and 30 seconds. Remember, I said that usually in a cloud provider, you need um, uh, 15 minutes at least for creating a real cluster. Now, in one minute, I created uh, three clusters and then um, I can say to the developers, uh, do whatever you want. So the rest of the process will finish um, super fast, I think. You can see the timings here. And after this is done, uh, we should also see, after this, finish, this step is done, we should also see that now Codefresh is uh, aware about the new clusters. So I'm going to visit the integration screen of Kubernetes that we saw before. If you remember, it was only uh, the real cluster. But now after it finishes, uh, let's see, it finished some of the clusters. I can go here into my settings and look at now the clusters that are known to Codefresh. And if I go now to clusters, you can see that now Codefresh knows about four clusters. And I've named them, you know, just to be clear, this is the real cluster, the parent cluster that has everything. And these are the three brand new clusters that I created, and they are completely virtual, and Codefresh knows how um, to deploy. It. So now I can do everything I want with Codefresh, and these clusters now are available by name. So a developer can say, hey, I want to deploy to this cluster name prod, and they don't care about kube config files or authentication uh, or anything else. So let's see if the, um, uh, everything else has finished. OK, so now it has finished. So if you go now to GitHub, uh, there should be a brand new uh, repository, which is for developers. And this is my Loft app. And also in Codefresh, there is a brand new project. 
So you see, this is the project I was working, and now there is a brand new project that was created automatically, and this has the pipeline for developers. So now I say to my developers, hey, I'm done. Now you can deploy uh, your application, and this is a normal standard pipeline that I'm going to run that takes the source code of the microservice, uh, compiles it, uh, pushes it to Docker Hub, and then, as an example, I'm deploying it to the QA cluster, and you know, in a more complex example, I would create more pipelines that uh, promote things from QA uh, to staging, uh, to production, and to the, the other things. So this is what I did as an operator. This is what I did behind the scenes. You can see it took me like five minutes. And without opening any ticket, without you know any lengthy process, I say to my developer, hey, your um, GitHub repo is fine. It's ready. Here is your pipeline for deploying. And now the developers can focus only on deploying code. So they can check out the repository. They can make a change. And this pipeline is already set up uh, to run uh, automatically for them. So as soon as they make a change, it will be deployed um, uh, to the QA environment right away. So everybody's super happy. Uh, developers got what they want. As an operator, I did, uh, let's say, a uh, super quick action of just clicking a button. Everything is stored in Git. There isn't you know, any fancy API. I know exactly what is in the cluster. I know exactly what is in the pipeline. I know exactly um, uh, what goes where. And then if somebody asks me, hey, how much time it takes for a new microservice to spin up, I can say five minutes. And not just me, I mean the developer um, uh, as well. So this will take some time to build Docker image, but I, this is actually the, um, the end. So I think we can go back uh, to the slides. So that's it. That's that's the end. I think the last example was the, um, the most realistic one. Uh, everything I've shown is on the first uh, link, the Terraform Lab. It has all the four demos uh, that you have seen. Big Cluster is the website of Big Cluster, which has a lot of uh, uh, ways you know how to use the documentation. The third link is how you install Loft for developers. And then the last three links are for uh, the Terraform providers that you have seen uh, today. And on the left, you have also two links if you want to know more about Loft, like the commercial project, or Codefresh, the, um, the commercial product. And that's it from, from my side. All right, Costas, that was uh, that was great. And we already have some questions. So here is the first question. And I will just read it out loud. Uh, are there pre-made cluster templates that we can add to our Loft account and modify? Can we manage them with Ansible playbooks? So yes, I didn't show this. Um, uh, maybe if we go back to the demo, uh, here there is a whole section for defining templates. And Loft gives you one template out of the box, which they call isolated, and it's a bit. Uh, let's say, better for security. But here, you can uh, create your own and do whatever you want. There is also a capability to pre-install some things in clusters. So if you want to say that every virtual cluster should have uh, Nginx and Cert Manager, uh, you can do it. Now, regarding your question about Ansible, I, I'm not the, per the proper person to answer this, but I already know that Loft has an API for all this. So I'm assuming you can also use Ansible uh, to call the the API, or you know, if too many people ask, they will say, okay, we already created a Terraform provider for Loft, let's create uh, Ansible playbooks. But this is a better question for the for the Loft team. The main capability of creating templates and pre-installed application in clusters is already there. Got it. And uh, for all the questions, uh, one of our teammates, Rich, uh, he is kind of typing some answers in the chat. And if you have more questions, you can also join our Slack community, slack.loft.sh. And then you can join the vCluster channel and you can ask the questions. And uh, Rich has been already answering some questions, but I will take one more question from Sukhain Kumar Tiwari. Here is the, here is the question, Kostas. So the question and is, can you explain the role the role role. of automation and infrastructure account is managing virtual clusters? So this is a super interesting question. And essentially, it comes uh, back to, to you know, where 
the job of the SRE starts and where it ends. Uh, some people think that infrastructure as code should be only, you know, infrastructure, like creating uh, Docker registries, uh, clusters, uh, load balancers. And then if you're working with applications, you should do something else. And a popular answer there is to use uh, Argo CD. Well, there is another, let's say, uh, idea that I try to show this today when you say everything is infrastructure. So even virtual clusters is infrastructure, pipelines is infrastructure, uh, GitHub hub repositories are infrastructure, and then you say we manage everything with Terraform. There isn't right or, right or wrong uh, answer there. It depends on what your, your company would do. I would say that if you are in a big company, maybe it makes sense to, you know, split some priorities and say not everybody needs to learn Terraform. Maybe, you know, after I create a cluster, a virtual cluster should be created with something else. Uh, but if you love Terraform or Pulumi or Crossplane or Ansible and you are in a startup, maybe you say, I want to manage everything as infrastructure as code. So that would be my, my answer. Got it. Uh, and then, Costis, I know we are already over time. Um, any thoughts on uh, production multi-tenancy with vCluster in terms of uh, any examples you have seen in the market? Uh, how people are using it, uh, any any comment on that, production multi-tenancy? So actually, this is a perfect question because this was the use case that we uh, we presented at KubeCon. So we at CodeFresh are using vCluster for multi-tenancy in production. Uh, we use it to power our hosted Argo CD uh, instance. And there was, it's this one, the first uh, link here is exactly this, how we use V cluster for multi tenancy in production in a kubecon presentation. So it exactly answers your question. Got it. Perfect. So I will make sure to send out that link to the to the registrants. All right. Uh, any last minute thoughts? Anything you want to add? Uh, I would like to say that we haven't seen yet. Uh, all the interesting use cases for V cluster. I think it's just the beginning. People are learning about the project and they are discovering and say, oh, can this help my process? And you know, some companies have already adopted it, but I think we'll see more companies finding new use cases and explaining more about the cluster. As I said, remember the slide about the Swiss Army knife? I think it's a great product that can be used for many use cases. Some of those that, you know, even the Loft team doesn't know yet. Like people will uh, be amazed with what companies will do. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. And uh, it, it's been great so far in terms of growth in vCluster. And of course, CodeFresh, Argo CD are uh, kind of backing us in terms of like using it and like you're doing webinar and you're you're giving talks in uh, KubeCon. So, so that's great. And uh, there will be a lot more use cases for, for sure. All right, everyone. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you, Costis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Few last things. If you have any more questions, as I said before, join slack.loft.sh. You can also go to loft.sh and get started. You can kind of try our product. Uh, if you have any specific use case, you can request a demo. And same thing with CodeFresh. You can go to CodeFresh, request a demo, and uh, they will be also happy to give you a demo. And all the links in the presentation, the GitHub repos, um, the KubeCon links, uh, we will send it out. Uh, in an email. And regarding the recording, we will also send that out. But because this is a LinkedIn Live, this video will stay here so you can come back and watch it. So with that, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, see you uh, next time. Thanks, Costas. Thank Bye. Bye.